and record here. So we're going to look at some of these depth of field assignments before we get into backlighting, because this is the, the most technically challenging assignment that I think in this uh, class. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, so I'm going to share screen here first. Let me, I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to pick one that was done uh, correctly. Let's see here. Um, who's not here? Anne. Uh, I think we'll go with Jillian, right? Yeah, Jillian. So I'm going to share screen. And uh, we'll go here. And we'll look at uh, Jillian here first. Close this window. Uh, move this. You, you all can't see these windows that pop up, I know. But, okay, so look at a couple of depth of fields here. Now, I think we might have already looked at Jillian's last week. Uh, I'll jump to another one too. But uh, So she did it perfectly, um, meaning really a lot of students ask me, well, what aperture should I use? And I can't tell you that. Like, it depends on the light, right? But a lot of times, 5.6, if you use 5.6, you're going to be around 250, 500, 1,000th outside. It's just with light, with bright light, you're going to be at that. You're going to be at that, okay? So her first shot at 5.6 was shallow depth of field. She's focused on the stairs here. She's focused kind of even closer than that. She looks like she's she actually focused right here on these leaves, right? She keeps her focal plane the same every time. You don't change what you focus on. So she's focused on these leaves, and at 5'6", at a 250th, that's what you it looks like. Then this, look at how much more in focus she is there. Okay, I'm going to go back. She's not in focus there. This isn't a focusing assignment, though. The reason she's more in focus here, she's still focused on the leaves, is because the depth of field now is 16. Deeper depth of field. More things are in focus farther back. So that's how that's done. So that's deeper depth of field. I like to usually start with a shallow depth of field, but it doesn't matter. That's shallow. That's deep depth of field. And the exposures are exactly the same. That's what you're looking for. At F16, she has to go to a 30th of a second shutter speed. It's it's not rocket science, but it's not just changing the focus on things. Uh, it's the camera. It's the, it's the depth of field. So here's the next one. F16 at a 60th. And this one's kind of crazy because it's still soft, even at F16. She's focused on this really close up this wall here, and then she goes to 5.6. Well, she starts at 5.6 on this one. This one's 5.6 at a 500th, and that's really soft and out of focus. Then she goes to F16. It's the same exact exposure, even though this is kind of strange. There's a haze here, but that's just that bokeh really hazing things up. But uh, that's 5.6, and that's F16. Ba the same exposures. Here's how it works. She's got five six at a five hundredth. So I'm gonna stop share for a second. She's five six, shallow depth of field. Five six at a five hundredth, right? And then she goes to sixteen. One two three. She closes her aperture down three stops. So if she does that, it's gonna be dark if she just switches to f sixteen and doesn't change her shutter speed. So she has to go. One, two, three to a 60th, which is exactly what she did to get the same two exposures. That's how that's how it's done. Um, I'm gonna share a screen one more time, just because off the top of my head, um, I know that I, there was one from the first class that was really and just the photographs were impressive. It was so I'm gonna use it as an example. So I'd probably use Jillian's too, because it's a really good example. Um, but I'm going to show you one more from my first class really quick. And uh, Owen. so he had this. Here's F5.6 at a 60th. So it was already kind of dark. 
Okay, he had five six at the sixty. It's really nice photo. Very good detail and resolution. Very good focus. I like the setup. It almost looks like a real car. It's a model. So here's five six at the sixtieth. Then he has to go to ISO stays the same. Then he has to go to sixteen. Look at the background. Look at the background difference. There's five six. There's sixteen. There's five six. There's sixteen. But look at the car in both of them. Every time I switch, there's five six. Look at the car's color exposure and everything there's 16 it's exactly the same the exposure is exactly the same so when he goes to f16 he has to go and again i'm gonna stop share because he's at a 60th at five six he's at a 60th at five six so here we go again with this he's at five six let me get this closer to the camera here he's at five six at a 60th he doesn't have a lot of light He's not, he doesn't have a lot of light. Then he goes one, two, three to 16. He has to let in three stops more light the other way. He has to go one, two, three, which is off my chart to an eighth. He has to go to an eighth of a second at F16 to get the same exposure, which is exactly what he does. Um, so that's how it's done. Um, you know, it's, it's challenging. And then he did it again here where he's at F5, 6 at a thousandth, which is a lot better, a lot more, a lot more light in this one. A lot of people did this indoors, which I said several times, do not do this indoors. You don't have enough light when you get to F16. When he's at F16, he's at a 125th. When you go to F16 and you're indoors, okay, you're not going to have enough light. You're going to have a tremendously long shutter speed. You never want, I can, I can honestly say this. I don't think there's ever a time that you will ever be inside, indoors, anywhere, that you will have an aperture of F16, ever. Um, I can't think, I can't think of a situation. If you're indoors, your aperture should be pretty good sized, four, five, three, Two eight five six maybe maybe f eight if you're shooting a big group in a church or something like that or you know maybe f eight because you need depth of field but you're never going to be at f sixteen indoors ever never you you generally want your aperture as big as you can possibly get most of the time um, and and I know some people would argue that and say no I I love depth of field. Uh, I mean, it's got its purpose if you're Ansel Adams and you're doing landscapes of Yosemite and you want every goat for miles to be in focus, sure, or every blade of grass, yeah. But generally, depth of shallow depth of field is generally a better look aesthetically. Um, it just is. Now, you don't want to get hooked on it. You got to know when to have depth of field, especially if you're photographing groups of people and you need some depth and you, you don't want everything to fall out of focus really fast. Yeah. Then you should go to like F8, F11, maybe. But when you're inside and your, your aperture is that small, you're, you're hurting yourself bad for light real bad. And you're going to be way down here with the long shutter speed and you do not want that long shutter speed. So just something to keep in mind, something to keep in mind. Um, so um, the one I was looking at yours, Marilyn, and I'm not sure what you did. Can we look at it real quick and kind of figure it out? Are you okay with that, Marilyn? Uh, sure. Okay. And and not to pick on you, because I, I think it just looked wrong, but I want to figure out why. And I think maybe it'd help everybody if we saw it. Um, and it, it's not a big deal. Um, I, I honestly, in this, on this assignment, usually only about 50% of my students get it right. So it's nothing to be like ashamed of, or, you know, worried about like, but, and I think what I was, I, and I just glanced at it, but cause it wasn't up, but okay. So what you have is it looks like on your first one. Oh, let me share screen. Okay. Um, on your first one, just looking at the group, I'm looking at the group exposure wise, these two look the same, which is good. Your exposures are exactly the same here, which is good. 
These, this one looks a little darker and I'm not sure what's going on yet, but this one's not the same exposure as this one. I can just tell that. But looking at this one, the pencil eraser is, okay, so you're saying that was your shallow depth of field, five, six, and an 80th. Okay, so you're focused on these brushes. This actually might be correct. Um, You just used your foreground as your fall off and that's okay, actually. Let's see. Now, yeah, you focus the same place and you're at F20, which is kind of a bad aperture, right? You should have just gone to 16. F20 is not an aperture. I mean, it is, but it's not, okay? F16 goes to 22. You should have just went to 16 because here's the thing. If you're at 5.6, you're at 5.6 at an 80th, which is also not a shutter speed. I know it is a shutter speed, but it's not a shutter speed. So I'm going to explain that. You're at five, six and an 80th. You're correct though. But if you're at five, six and an 80th, right? See if you understand this. If you're at five, six and an 80th, which is somewhere between standard shutter speed, 60th and a 125th. If you're at five, six and an 80th, then when you go to 16, one, two, three, which you didn't, you went to like 20, which is like 16 and a half. So you, you went one, two, three and a half not the 16. So when you when you're at this, what do you do here? Do you go one, two, three and a half? I mean, where is that? And how do you figure that out? And I know what you did. Maybe I, I'll ask you, but I'm pretty sure what you did is you just looked at your light meter and it said even good exposure both times, right? When you switched to F20, you just moved your shutter speed until it said good exposure. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 honestly, that works. You did that. That's correct. You know what I'm saying? That is the, yeah, if you use your light meter, which I, as an inst photo instructor, I would never tell you not to use your light meter. It's good. You did because those two exposures are the same. You did it right. It's just, you kind of did it in a weird way to where you didn't have a way of calculating it. You know what I mean? Like you, you just kind of just trusted your light meter, which worked. So, and that's good. So that one's, that one's good. Um, and then let me go to the next one and we'll see what's going on here. Okay. Um, and then here you, let's see, you start out at, it's kind of hard. Okay. Softer depth of field, maybe. No, this is F20 again, which I would have just been at F16. So you're at a fifth of a second and then you go to 6.3, which is also a weird aperture. So do you have these? screenshotted these at standard apertures and shutter speeds because that's a problem because that's what's throwing you off here is you, you're at six three which there's no way to calculate that but i can definitely tell on this one that this one's brighter than this one so you did it almost like correctly i mean you're you're not that far off right i'm not going to ding you a bunch on this you're pretty close but here it's just these aren't the same exposure. So that's why we're using like F16 or F20 and F6.3. There's no way you can calculate it. And just because your light meter says, well, you get an even exposure. It's okay if you just went on F5.6, right? You Let's say you started at this one. You, you don't have to take your what your light meter says as the word of law, like is what I'm trying to say, right? So I'm going to share one more time and explain what I'm saying here, and then we'll be done. Um, when you had F6.3 at a, a 60th here, okay, you could have just made that 5.6 at a 60th and not and not even worried if your, your light meter said it was a little bit overexposed. But the other problem is you're already at a really slow shutter speed here at, at a big aperture. So then when you went to this next one at F20, 20, which is a huge, tiny, tiny, tiny aperture. Now you're at like a fifth of a second. You don't have a lot. It's a really long shutter speed. And you can't really tell where you should have gone because what was, what is, if I ask you, what is three stops smaller aperture than F6.3? If I ask that, what is three stops smaller aperture than F6.3? I could probably ask that to a thousand professional photographers and none of them would know, right? And what I mean by that is if you're at F6.3 and I say, what is three stops smaller than 6.3? One, two, three. 
Well, it's F 16.7 or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what it is. So that that's why that becomes problematic. But either way, you're still really close. And I, I totally see that you understand kind of the idea. The idea being the main overarching idea of depth of field simply is this, that you have to, if you make this smaller and let in less light and you want the same exposure, you have to make this longer to compensate for it. That's the main thing of this assignment is that you use these two together to get your exposures. If you make this one more light, you're going to have to make this one less light to compensate for it. So, and I see that you get that. So that's good. So good job. Um, all right. So um, what I what we're talking about today, it's not going to be a long lecture. I hope I'm not trying to bore anybody, but we want to, we're still talking about light, right? Um, portrait lighting was the last thing we touched on, and that was the first real introduction to light. Um, and we're going to do this for the next two weeks, today and next week. Um, and really, you could teach the whole, you could have a whole photography class just on light, using light. Um, because it is, like I've said before, the most important thing in photography. Uh, I was joking to the first class and I said, go out and touch grass. All right. And it's just a thing that people say on the Internet. But I mean that like to go outside and use the best light source you have, which is the sun. Stop. And, and in this class is not that bad. In the first class, it's a little more of a problem. But stop taking photos in your house. Get out of your house. Go go somewhere interesting, even though I know we live in Dayton, Ohio, but get out and walk around, look around, get in your car and drive to a park or something. Go somewhere, right? Get out of the house. Um, I know it's, it's you know, and I don't say that to try to be a bully or mean or anything, but I, I just think a lot of, even since the whole thing that happened with COVID three years ago, I think a lot of people are still kind of like that. And I get it. But if you want if you want to get good light, you have to kind of go outside to get it unless you have a studio, unless you have like a studio at home. Um, so even, you know, if you don't want to go out in like public, just go out to a park or somewhere, you know, out in the just take a walk, you know, go go hiking or something. But all right. So that's my first point of advice, because for this next assignment, you have to do it outside. And next week, you're going to have to do it outside as well okay these are all outdoor assignments and i want you to think about portrait lighting for a second and what you did with portrait lighting and now i want you to think of the sun and i want you to think of the sun as a light bulb that's all it is it's a giant light bulb in the sky that's all it is and it and it does the same thing every day for millennia it starts in the east it comes up it does a big circle and then it stops in the west that's what it does it's a giant light bulb starts in the east <laughs> goes in a circle above us and then comes down in the west right it's all it is it's a giant light bulb if you think about it that way photographically it will help you to understand why it's so important that you position your subjects in relation to that giant light bulb in the sky and so many people ignore that um, professionals, semi-professionals, people that don't think about it. They all ignore, a lot of people ignore it. I ignored it for a long time. I didn't think about it. I mean, if it was there and it looked good, it was like, oh, I accidentally, it looks good. I didn't think about it, um, until I started shooting professionally. And really that was everything. Um, so today we're talking about backlighting. Okay. And there's two ways to talk about backlighting. Okay. Backlighting bad. I know I've said that in the past, right? Backlighting is not good lighting. It's terrible lighting. Um, but it's also a very effective light. I shouldn't put it in that category as terrible lighting because sometimes it's not, it can be very effective. You've, I'm sure you've all seen really cool photos with like backlight coming out and like glow and everything else. It can be great, but you have to have good front lighting too. And that's what we're going to talk about today is either there's two ways to go about backlighting something, either intentionally or unintentionally. And the unintentionally is where the problems arise, right? And the people that photograph uh, things with backlit unintentionally 
it's really obvious to us. Um, and some of us might not know why. I'm pretty sure most of you do. When you see it, you might know why. But I'm going to explain that. But you would be surprised. Like, I'm a hockey fan. I like hockey. Um, and I follow the Columbus Blue Jackets. And I watch their social media stuff. And hockey, for whatever reason, the past few years, the player, it's all about the, what the cool outfits the players are wearing when they're coming into the rink before the game, right? And they literally have professional photographers that work for them. I'm sure they're just their social media people, but I know that they're paid by the Columbus Blue Jackets organization. Take these photos of these players coming into this dark arena and then they have this big, bright, open door behind them walking in and this big, bright, open door with the sunlight and all this glare from the winter behind them. And they're taking these photos half the time without flash. And I, I don't see it every time, but I've seen it a lot. And all you see is this really badly underexposed image of this player. And it's they're literally saying, look at this outfit they're wearing. So I know that their purpose is to show the player, but they're they don't know how to expose for it. Like they're, they're cam they're in auto mode on their cameras apparently. And they're exposing for the bright light behind them. Okay. And it looks awful. And I've seen this a lot, not on just the blue jackets, but I see this a lot and what that is. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you some examples now um, of it. And we're going to, we're going to look at first, we're going to look at um, bad examples of backlighting. And then we're going to look at when it's done intentionally and why it's such a good thing to do if you do it intentionally. All right. So let me open up um, um, da, 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 uh, Photoshop really quick. And it's going to take a second. And then we're, I'm going to share a screen of Photoshop. Yeah. And we're going to, and I have bad examples of backlighting. One of them, uh, I sort of, I took from Facebook a friend of mine from a beach photo and it's it's okay. I mean it, it, it but it's it's kind of a learning it's kind of a good learning process here. So we'll look at these here. I mean I have to move all these windows. It's a little trickier with uh the online class. I have two monitors. So okay, there it is. I'm going to open up these four photos real quick and then I'll I'll share a screen. Okay? They're just going to open in Photoshop. Okay, hopefully it doesn't crash my system. Yeah, it doesn't. Good. All right. All right. Now I'm going to share screen and find that window. Goodness. Okay, that's here. I'm going to close my internet. Okay, sorry. I'm almost there. Right here. Going to Photoshop. Sharing screen in Photoshop. Okay, so... I'm going to move it over to this monitor and I'm going to start with the first one. Okay. Well, that's the last one. Okay. So we'll start with this one. Okay. So hopefully, yeah, I think you can all see that because there's a green highlight. Okay. So when we look at this, we all know that's not a, that's probably not what they meant to do, right? That's an accident. And let's talk about what happened there. And I'm going to kind of ask because I want to I want to try to get a little bit more input. But can anyone tell me what they think happened in this photo? Like why why the person in the front of that house is so dark? Well, it looks like he's right against a window, so the lighting is right behind him. Right, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're you're absolutely correct about that. Um, why would that make him dark, though? Why would he be dark? As far as camera operation goes, what what would make him dark? Why did that happen? If you don't know, that's okay too. Take a guess. You can if you guess wrong, it's okay. I'm not gonna, you know, belittle you for a wrong guess. What would you think happened to make him dark in the camera? Why would that happen? Anybody? What does a light meter do? Let me ask that. Tell me, somebody tell me what a light meter does. You got to know what a light meter does. I mean, I'm not asking for a technical how it works, but what does it do? Let me see here. Admit Jillian. Okay. Anyone? What is a light? What would a light meter do? What did the light meter do in this image? 
Oh, somebody said something in chat. Dark room and taking the photo towards the light behind them. Yes, right. Yeah, and Anne's right. See in chat, right? So what did the light meter do, right? The light meter, what? Um, the light meter, yep, yeah, exactly, right. That's it, Ann. That's something you need to know. And, and again, like, um, this is what separates this class from finger painting or, um, you know, if the iPhone photo class, right? Which, and I don't mean that in any negative way, but I think some people, when they take photography, they hear the word photography and they think, oh yeah, it's pointing my thing, you know, it's pointing my thing at something that I see and pushing the button and then yay, I have a photo, right? That's the way the world has become. And, and I'm not, I'm not some crotchety old man against that, but the problem with that is there's, there's a lot of mechanisms going on with photography when you, when you're using a lens in the, in the phone or in the camera or whatever it is, when you're using a lens, a shutter speed, a light meter, ISO, there's a lot going on mechanically there. Right. And some people might say, well, I don't need to know that. I just push the button and it works. But the problem with that, what it's, what it's done in photography these last 15 years is made a lot of people just documenters of things rather than creators, rather than, you know, artists. Um, and that's a problem. So learning these kind of things and how they work and using your camera as a tool to make better photos is kind of the goal of this class. And I don't expect everybody to be professionals, like I said, when you're done. But back to this, a little little brief side rant there. But so what happened is exactly what Ann said. When you point your light, when you point your camera at something and you're in auto mode, just like, and, and Marilyn wasn't in auto mode, I know that, Marilyn was using manual. But even then, if you point your cam, even if you have your camera in manual mode, and I'm in this room with this guy in this dark room, and he's standing in front of that window, and I'm in manual mode, and I take my light meter out, or I, and I'm using my light meter and my camera, and I go to zero on it, mid good exposure, guess what it's going to do? It's going to do this. Because the camera thinks this is a good exposure. And by all intents and purposes, it is a good exposure. It's a good exposure of the sky in that house. It's a great exposure of that sky in that house. Because here's the thing about cameras. They, they don't know that you really wanted to take a picture of your brother Joe in that dark room. The camera can't read your mind. It's not going, oh, wait, that's Joe. And he, he's got a good smile on his face. And what they really wanted was a picture of that. Yes, and maybe next year. They'll have AI that will understand that, which to me is great, I guess. But, you know, I'd rather understand it. Um, so on an iPhone, if you were shooting this, what would you do? You would tap on his face, right? You would tap on his face and it would start to come into exposure. OK, and now here's my next question. I'm going to keep asking questions, even if I only get a couple of you. Now, if I use my iPhone and I tapped on his face in that photo, what would happen? while I'm taking the photo and I start tapping his face. Anybody? You know, you you have to know this. You've done this. It'd like focus and get a little brighter. It would, yeah, exactly, Marilyn. It would focus and get a little brighter. That's exactly correct. And how would it do that? Do you know? Like, what do you think the phone's doing when it's doing that? What do you think's going on? Do you think it's not magic? Right. I mean, it's not like all of a sudden it starts beaming out light onto the face. What does it do? It just opens up the aperture more or makes the shutter speed longer in your phone. Your phone has an aperture and a shutter speed in it. That's all it does. It just changes your aperture and shutter speed to be brighter. To let in more light. But guess what happens when you do that? Right. You got to think about this. What happens when you tap on your phone and you let in more light in this photo? What happens to this background? It becomes blown out white, right? It just becomes blown out white because all when you change the exposure in an image, it changes the it changes the image all over the entire image. It's not like a dodge and burn tool in there in your camera. 
it's just, it's going to change the exposure for the entire image. So when you start to tap on his face, this is going to start to get blown out. But who really cares about this? Nobody that I can think of would, oh my God, I can't see the house now. When really you all you cared about was your jo your brother Joe here, you wouldn't care, right? So technically you'd want to tap on the face or what about this? What about this as a solution? What 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 are the two solutions we have for that situation? The one is making our aperture bigger and our shutter speed longer so that Joe is exposed correctly in that room. Okay, that's one solution. And I'm saying we're not going to be able to move Joe or do anything because my solution would be move him away from that window. That would be my solution. I would turn him to the side and have the side light of the window coming in. But we're talking about if we only have two solutions to fix this problem of Joe in front of the window. The first solution is tap on it if you're on a phone or open your aperture bigger and make your shutter speed longer. That's going to make the exposure of him better. The back of the window is going to get blown out white. It doesn't matter because we don't care about the house in the sky. The second solution is the better solution. Put one of these on your camera. Flash, right? You would <clears throat> focus on Joe just like it was. You take this flash, you put it on your camera. You point it at Joe. Boom, problem solved. You Now you've lit him and your background still looks good. You keep your exposure the same. You keep your exposure the same for the, the house in the sky back there. This is why people use flash, okay? That's the main reason people use flash, to get HDR, high dynamic range. That's what a flash does, okay? A flash can light the shadow areas in a scene and still keep the highlight areas nice and exposed right because that flash is not gonna jump through that window all the way out to that house across the street and hit it. It's not, it's just gonna hit the guy's face in the window. So if you do it right, if you angle it right, you're gonna have a good image of him in front of that window and a good exposure of the stuff behind him. That's the number one reason people use flash. The number two reason people use flash or maybe the number one, but they're both pretty important is if just if you're in a dark place, if you're indoors or it's nighttime, you use a flash to brighten everything up, obviously, right? That's the obvious one. But flash also does, will light both the subject and the background. That's what flash does, okay? So why am I talking about all this? Because this is all camera operations. This is all stuff, you know, I can't get too deep into flash, but that's why we use flash. So let's look at a couple other ones here. And then we'll, we're going to talk about why it's a good thing. Okay. So there's that one. Not good, right? Not good. That's what that photographer did not intend to do that. So <clears throat> the next one, same thing, right? So I'm not going to go over the same thing, but what did the camera expose for here? It didn't expose even for his ears, even though that light is shining through his ears. It exposed for the grass out here. It exposed for what's lit. Like I said, a light meter is not a thinking thing. It just goes, oh, it sees light. It takes the light into the camera and it goes, okay, this is what aperture and shutter speed I need for this lit area. The, the, the light meter always exposes for the brightest area of the scene. The light meter will not expose for the shadows. It does not do that. It does not know how to read shadows. It reads light. That's why it's called a light meter, because it reads light. All right? So that's why, that's what separates a photographer that knows what they're doing with the photographer that doesn't know what they're doing, that they know how to read their light meter correctly and say, well, yeah, my light meter told me this, but technically my light my light meter's wrong because what I really want to expose for is this kid. Right? So, if and again, if I use like a flash, I could do it. If I used a flash and this probably won't work, but I could dodge I it, it would brighten him up. Yeah, it's not going to work. This is a an image I took off the internet. It's not something I've taken. But you a flash would fill all that in with bright light and you'd be good, all right? So um, there's something to that. Now here, the same thing, 
you know, and this one's a little, maybe they wanted the, in my opinion, maybe they wanted it this way, who knows, but I took it because again, the bright area is what the light meter exposed for, which is right here. It exposed for this area right here. And she's dark, she's dark. But again, that's actually kind of an interesting image the way it is. Maybe that's what the photographer intended there. But I can assure you on this one, okay? And this is one, I can assure you here, okay? That this photographer loved this sunset, okay? And that's good. We all love sunsets. Photographer loved that sunset and said, hey, everybody, let's do a beach picture. Problem being, they their phone, which they photographed with, again, what did the phone light meter do? There's a light meter in your phone, believe it or not. Okay. And the light meter read the light and said, okay, I'm making a good exposure for this stuff back here. I'm making a good exposure for this beautiful sky. So what does that do? And again, this is what you have to wrap your head around. If you're going to make a good exposure for the bright area, the shadow area is not going to be so good. So you, as a general rule of thumb, as a photographer, you need to make sure your shadows are taken care of first. You have to. You cannot just expose for the light. And that's why no photographer will ever go out on jobs and just shoot in auto mode the entire time. Because if they did, all their photos would look like this. If they shot, if, if you just shot auto all the time, this is what your photos would always look like. And people would not be happy about it. If I gave this photo to a client, if it was me, the photographer on this beach right now, taking this as like a family photo, the first thing I would have done is I would have waited until they walked out of the scene. Okay, I wouldn't have had that, right? I would have waited 10 seconds. Okay. Second thing I would have done is if they really wanted that sunset, what would I have done? What would I have done? I'll give you a hint. I would have put a flash on my camera. I would have flashed them. So then that way I would have still exposed for the sky. I wouldn't change my exposure. I would just take my flash and hit them with a little bit of flash. It's called fill flash, fill. What does it fill? It fills the shadows. That's what I would do. And then I would have a really nice photo and the sunset would be nice and yellow and orange and blue sky. And they would be lit too, because my flash is good enough to cover them. That's what I would have done. All right. So those are important concepts in photography. And one of the things I, I cannot emphasize enough is if you look at me sitting in this room right now, there's at least 10 zones of light in this room. I promise you that. That little, look at that little shadow, right? I'm, I'm reversed, but look at this shadow. Okay. Look at that shadow right there. That's caused by my bookshelf, a little triangular shadow. That's a zone. Look at that light right there. That's a zone. That amp and down here where it gets a little dark, that's a zone down there. That's a different, that's a different shade of darkness than that is over there. Okay. So my point is, look at, look at like when I lean forward, look at my shirt and everything down here. That's another zone. This is darker than that is. This is darker than that is over there. So how do I expose? If I've got all these different shades, how do I make the correct exposure? Do I expose for the light? No, no. I expose for the shadow. If I was taking a photo in here, which I wouldn't, but I would, I would get my light me, I would get my exposure set to where I would see detail in this black enough. Not so it has to be like looking gray, but I would want it to still look black, but I would get detail in this. Generally, that's what you want to do is expose for your shadow. The beauty of digital photography is you've got all those editing tools that you can, if you're not, if you didn't make the greatest exposure, you can fix it. In film, you couldn't fix it. It's there. You're done. I mean, you can you can do things on the print side, dodging and burning and all those kind of things, but your negative is your negative. Um, and I know Jillian knows that. Um, so what's my point of all this? The, the, my point is there's a lot of technical process that goes into this, understanding what makes a good exposure. And I don't expect you all to be experts in exposure, but what are we talking about? Backlighting, all right? 
So all this stuff I've told you so far about these accidents, the funny thing is I want you to make that accident. I We're going to do this, but we're going to do it on purpose. Okay. We're not going to do a an accidental backlit photo, right? Of a family on a beach or an accidental backlit photo of a kid in front of a window. We're going to do a purposeful backlit photo. We're going to do it on purpose. Um, so let's look really quickly. I'm just going to just do what I did last time in the first classes. I'm just going to Google, and I do this every class, silhouette photography, and I'm going to show you. And some people think this is kind of a dated thing. It's kind of 80s. It's kind of lost its prevalence in photography. And you know what? Maybe it has. Maybe it has, but it's still a good exercise. Um, so here's silhouette photography. OK, how this is done, there's some main factors and there's an article in eLearn to read that will tell you how to shoot it. OK, but mainly what's the idea here? Let's just look at this one. OK. Right there. Now, there's some there's 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 a few things I want to discuss just about this image in particular. OK, one. The subject is very pronounced. We know exactly what this photographer was going to photograph and why, or is, is was intending on photographing and why. It's a giraffe and a tree. There's not 15 rhinos over here. There's not six more trees over here. There's not a mountain here, back, like blocking the sun back here. So the first rule of silhouette photography is to make sure your subject stands out and is pronounced. This is a very strong subject style of process. And I look for that when I'm grading. Um, I want your subject to stand out. Now, does that mean you'll be able to go to the Sahara Desert or wherever this is? That's not the Sahara, the whatever, Central Africa um, next weekend and photograph giraffes and trees? No. How are you gonna do this? Well. You're going to have to get outside and maybe drive to a, a empty open parking lot and get a subject. It does not have to be a person. Okay, I'm going to show you student examples here and you'll see that. But your subject has to stand out. It has to really be about that subject. So the second thing I want to say is look where the subject to ground relationship is in this. What I mean by that is where is the ground in this photo? It is maybe a half inch of the bottom of this photo. And so many people put the ground so far up into their photo, like in the middle. And it's just, there's no reason for it. And you're going to see that in some of my student examples. If you put the, if you took this ground and the way you cropped, the, the way you composed this photo is you put the ground up here, okay? And the giraffe is up here at the top and the tree is up here at the top. You've basically got half of a black photo. That's what you're going to have. So why do that? Photograph the majesty of the sky. This is, this is kind of a sky photography assignment, too, in a way. You could say it's a sky photography assignment. You're photographing the sky. So knowing you're photographing the sky, let me ask you this. Talking about that giant light bulb in the sky, what time of day would be the best time to do this? Do you think? I got anybody still with me? <laughs> like sunset? Would that be the best time? Yeah, Grady. Good. Good answer. That's correct. Sunset or sunrise. But if you're like me, sunset, I'm not, I'm barely up at sunrise. I'm not feeling like photographing. But if you are, if you're a morning person, sunrise works too. But exactly correct. Grady's right. Sunrise or sunset. Because the giant light bulb in the sky is lower. It and if you look, if you look, um, I'm going to tap here and see if I can. There we go. If you look at a lot of these, you will actually see the sun in them. And you can photograph the sun in these, okay? Especially if it's lower. Now, I'm not saying stare at the sun, obviously. But you can get the sun in these. And even if you don't get the sun in them, you can get very, like, look, there the sun, I think, I'm guessing, but it looks like is directly behind her. But again, look at the ground here. It's very low still. It kind of comes up, but I like it in this. This is a good image. 
Um, it comes up at an angle, but again, the ground is very low. This is a photo of the sky. I mean, it's obviously a photo of this girl too, you know, and it's good, but that's the thing is it's a very strong subject against the sky. And I'm going to tell you how to do it again. You can't shoot. And I don't want you shooting an auto, but you're going to quote unquote, trust your light meter in these photos. You're going to say, okay, I'm most of the, my image is sky. My light meter says I need to be at F 16 at a 500, which is probably kind of close to what you'll be. I don't know. It's going to be bright. You're going to be pretty stopped down in your camera. You're not going to have a giant aperture probably. Okay. But whatever your light meter tells you, listen to it. And then I would say, then even go a little bit darker. So if your lighter meter says zero and you're at zero, when you're making this exposure, go even a little bit darker. So let me, I wasn't sharing a screen. I'm going to go back to it. I was talking about this girl and this one. Sorry about that. This, right? So if your light meter says zero, you could even make the sky a little bit darker blue by going under a stop, but this is a good one. Uh, but again, you can have the sun in the image. You can do things like this. It's a little bit kitschy, but you know, sometimes it's cool. I actually think it's kind of cool here. Um, you know, you, it, there's a lot you can do with this. I know we're not at the ocean. The ocean is perfect for it because it's such a wide open space. We don't have oceans here, but literally you can go to a park with a like a pond that's a decent sized pond and do this. Backlighting in front of a pond would be very good doesn't have to be even a huge pond it's got to be bigger than like a little backyard 10 foot farm pond but i mean you can find like a moderately sized small lake or pond and you could do this okay you just need open space because one of the things you don't want and you're going to see this here you have a little bit of distraction with this tree but it's not that bad okay but you don't want a lot of stuff cluttering up your foreground now here it works too because it's framed in it's actually pretty good right? These leaves in the street doesn't look bad. So what I'm going to show you now are some student examples on Flickr, and I'll, I'll give you more of an idea of what I'm trying to say not to do if you can avoid it. But most of these student examples are pretty good. Um, we're going to go here to albums, and we're going to go to backlighting, and I'm not going to really pick apart every one of these, but this first one, now that's exactly what I was talking about on the ground, right? Why have the ground halfway up your photo? Don't do that. Put your ground near the bottom of the photo, right? Get closer to your subjects, get below them. And they he started to do that with these. Now here he's getting a little bit better. I'm still not real enthused by this giant tree next to him, okay? I mean, it's not that big of a deal. It's not the end of the world. He did this right. I mean, I'll give him that. Like, this is absolutely correct as far as an exposure goes. Great job. The sky is almost dark. So that's what I'm saying. You almost want to underexpose a little bit. Okay. So then on the next one, he, um, then this one, this is my favorite one, but I wish he wasn't in it. And, and that's what I say about this every time. I wish that he would have just gotten out of that photo and it just would have been the sun with these these really cool things growing up here because that's enough for me. That's good silhouette. Like I would have kind of loved this photo a lot more had the sun maybe been over here, just move it over to the left or move it over to the right or the left in a third instead of kind of right in the middle, even though it's not perfectly in the middle, but move the sun maybe over here and just get the silhouettes of these things, okay? So you don't have to put people in it, all right? Um, it can be just nature. But uh, I'm going to come back to these. And this is one of my favorite ones here, too. I just kind of wish this chimney of this house wasn't in it. But if you go from here up, it's a beautiful image. Um, and here, this is kind of a shallow depth of field. I don't have the settings on it, but this is probably like F4. OK, but you get this really nice, soft depth of field. And again, what are you exposing for? You're exposing for the sky behind. OK, so everything in front of it is going to be black or dark so how do we do this we have to go outside we have to look at the sun not stare at it but know where the sun is and then move until we have something in front of the sun whatever it may be it can be tree branches it can be a person it could be a stop sign i mean i want you to be creative with this this is kind of a creative assignment as well okay this isn't like depth of field um, I want this one to be more creative. 
whatever it is, you have to put whatever your subject is between you and the sun. So the sun's behind it. You're backlighting, you're backlighting your image, and then you expose for the sky and the sun. Does that make sense? Does, does everybody get that? What we're trying to do here? Open space. Um, let's look at a few more. Um, if you have questions, please ask. Um, open space. You have it here. Look, I mean, this is a close-up of a dead leaf, right? And it's it, it's you know, it's it's kind of beautiful, honestly. Um, and it's because of the sun. Okay. I mean, is it the best photo I've ever seen? No, but it's, it's good. I, I really enjoy this. And what I like about it is the, the sun's even poking its way through the little holes in the leaf where it's starting to deteriorate. Right. So it does it. This is backlight. This is backlit and that's all it is. So don't think it has to be this wide open, majestic expanse of a landscape either. Okay. And then this, right. It's just a barn with a weather vane. You know, you could probably sell that to people. People would probably buy that image, um, you know, hang it up in their barn or, or hang it up in their ho home if they got like a country type house, you know. But and then again, here's just a landscape, right? And it's just the sky. OK, we see I know we do. I know all of you do see dozens and dozens of sunset. I do anyway. I see sunset photos all the time and they get boring. OK, I'll be honest. But if they're done right, I'm still I can still be excited about a good sunrise or sunset photo. Right. And like this one, I think is beautiful. OK, so, you know, and we all have different tastes. Now, this one is done indoors. It's like the kid in front of the window and I have it in my examples, but I highly, highly, highly suggest not doing things indoors. If you want to do one in front of the window, do one. Okay. But don't do a, don't do a lot of this indoors. Okay. Get outside and use the sun as your light because it's going to lead you into this next assignment, environmental lighting as well. But I'm not against this. This is a cute little photo. It works. It's well composed. I don't really care so much about suburban Kettering here or wherever this is, but I think it fits with the theme of this. You know, you could joke these two little lizards got married and they finally bought a house in a nice suburban neighborhood or whatever, you know, there's something to this. It's kind of funny. So that's good. Um, and then back outside again, though, these are the, to me, where they really shine, where you have sunlight. Sunlight is just outdoor sunlight is just to me a little more magical than any kind of artificial light you can get. If, if it's captured correctly. Um, so this is a great image. I love like you can see her like just the toes stretched out and just this. It's just a, what a clean shape. You know, it's just perfectly clean. So that's really nice. Good focus. Fast shutter speed. Yeah. Five hundredth of a second. So that's really nice. And then, you know, again with this and and and, and again, these are. It depends on your taste, right? Like I wouldn't hang that in my house, but I know a lot of people that would and would really enjoy that photo. Um, so that's what it's about. And here, I want to express this as well. Does it mean that the sun has to be directly behind your subject? Absolutely not. This, the sun is, I can see the it's getting whiter over here. The sun is sort of at the side, and be, but it's still behind the subject. It's just to the side and behind. And actually this is, Next week, environmental lighting, this is it. Okay. So if you if you want to practice environmental lighting, don't put the sun directly be, behind your subject exactly. Put your sun at a high 45 behind your subject. Try that. Or not real high, but a, like a low 45. Okay. And see what you get. Uh, you know, mellow sounds of the 70s album right there, you know, like uh yacht rock like mellow rock you know i don't know that's the feeling i get from this it's just a real mellow vibe whatever but it's cool it's good it's a good portrait right so and like i i like this one just because of that bird just caught in flight there and it's weird how its wings are almost look like they're closing but it's an interesting image and it's backlit why i like that one too is it's not only backlit but it's like an action shot too so um, and then this is an indoor one, not like, I don't like that you can see the light itself, but I leave it as an example because it's an extreme, it's an extreme example of backlighting for sure. 
And then you have, this is one I took of my kid downtown a couple years, a few years ago. Um, and what I did is I just put him under an overhang. So there's like an overhang over him. So he's right on the edge of the shadow. The bottom of the photo is actually right here. So there's about a half inch or an inch of darkness that's in the photo. And I have him right on the edge of the shadow. I wanted to capture his red shoes just a little bit, just for that color. And then he almost just looks like a hole in the sidewalk, right? I mean, it's so, that's why I kind of liked it. It just looks almost like he's not real in a way, like ghostly. Um, but all that is, is backlit, right? Yeah, 30 photos for this, 30 and 10, yes. Which is, it's on the assignment too. It's It says that in the assignment, but it is 30 and 10. So again, backlit. So let me show you, and these right here, if you're going to do backlighting inside and you're going to set it up, I almost want to see stuff like this. If you're going to do it, take it that extra mile and really do it, right? This guy was great. He did, he's a design major, did some really great work. So there's a lot of examples to look at here, okay? And, you know, even this, it's just a nice little, you know, it's our child sitting down on the on the pavement in the driveway. Really nice light coming through. The background's a little bit, it's okay. It's a little bit of a distraction. I just, it's me personally. I have a pet peeve with cars. Like I would really wish that that minivan wasn't right behind his head. But, you know, you can't control everything. Um, but then this one's amazing as well. Last one in the series, really good, really good. I love the reflection. Okay, so there's a lot you can do. The other thing I'm going to do really quickly since Vanessa, Vanessa asked is I want to go to Sinclair and I'm going to go to eLearn. And um, we're going to go to um, our class. And if you go to content and I'm not going to I'm not going to read these articles, but if you go to content. Again, content and then you go to environmental or, or uh, backlighting right here. All the assignments are here, some of the other stuff, but then it starts self portrait, perspective, emphasize color. All the assignments are here. If you go to backlighting and click on it, it tells you right here 30 images in a Flickr album called Backlighting Working, 10 images in a Flickr album called Backlighting Selects. Okay. And then there's also this article How to Photograph a Guide to Pro Level Silhouette Photography. Okay. So you can look at that maybe get some more information, right? Make sure your flash is off. That's a huge, you don't want your flash on, that's for sure. So there's that article, okay? And then there's another one. Uh, oh, and then it just has the student examples and this just kind of says what they're about. Um, so that's it, there's an article there. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's 30 and 10. One more quick recap. When you're out there and you're pointing your camera at the sky and you've got your silhouette, you got your subject between you and the sun, trust your light meter, make it even, make it zero on the light meter, and then even go down a little bit less exposure, even a little bit darker, and you'll be good. All right? Experiment a little bit with it. Okay? And that's it. That's 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 uh, that's all there is to it. Um. But this is a creative assignment, and I, I want you, I really do, I want you to, I don't want you to drive three hours all over the place, but find somewhere with a nice open space. It's really going to go a long way and do it outdoors, okay? So I'm going to quit Photoshop here, and then um, I think we're done. Um, if you have any questions, please hang out after class. And Anne, can you hang out for a second so we could talk about maybe meeting up and talking about uh, the, the thing you were emailing me about? Yep. Okay. So we're all free to go and then I'll stop recording. I'm done with this.